in what will certainly go down as an historic election, Donald Trump was just elected as the 47th President of the United States. It's over 100 years, Grover Cleveland, since there was a president that served two non-consecutive terms. But this was far more than that. Maybe the most disruptive president in our history. All the controversies, the court cases, last, the January 6th events back in 2020, the impeachments in his first term, all the vitriol and accusations of calling him the worst possible thing he was long given up on. Everybody wrote, that was it. He had one term, and Trump is in the past. And yet, in the words of the New York Times, stunning return to power. Stunning comeback. How did this happen? And above all, what are the lessons we learned from this? Please join me in this most timely and relevant discussion. Lessons from Trump's unprecedented victory. Simon Jacobson here, and we will be discussing Lessons from Trump's Unprecedented Victory. This program is dedicated by Brett Adler in honor of his parents, Paula and Michael Adler. Who would have believed? Mr. Trump was president from 2016 to 2020. Then he lost an election to Mr. Biden. That itself was a whole story. Everyone remembers January 6th, the uprising in Washington, how Trump was written off that he would never return. The impeachments in his first term, the controversies, the accusations, the court cases, the court cases, an indicted, pres- indicted former president running for election, the upheavals, first with Biden, then with Kamala, the accusations that were hurled against him, calling him everything. And here... He rises to power. A stunning comeback to power, in the words of the New York Times. This will be analyzed and go down in history. It's over 100 years, more than 100 years, since Grover Cleveland served two scattered, two non-consecutive terms. But here there's far more. No one would believe that Trump would have come back. Throw into the equation the the assassination attempts. And again, the way he was demonized. Now they'll analyze how it all came back to haunt them, that it worked against them. America did not buy that narrative. Whatever other stuff that people will throw out there. Backfired, basically. And it was a really powerful victory. Besides the Electoral College, also the popular vote. And in countries that he reversed. Who would believe he would have reversed countries? It's states that he reversed. Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia. Well, North Carolina didn't reverse, but still a swing state. Wisconsin. Looks like Michigan. So I'm not here to analyze all the reasons behind it, what was going on in the American public. Was it a vote for Trump or was it a vote against what everyone felt was a sham in his opposition? 
What I want to focus on is the lessons we learn from this. Because above all, what does it teach us? We all, decent people, whoever wins an election, we pray that God will bestow and bless the President of the United States with the wisdom, the courage, the sensitivity to be a true world leader and lead people in fulfilling the mission for which they were sent to this world. I remember I wrote a letter back in 2016, an open letter to Mr. Trump. I'll probably publicize that letter again. Some anti-Trumpers didn't like it, but it wasn't a letter for Trump per se. It's a letter for the president. It's a position, the most powerful position in the world. But what are the lessons for us? Well, the most obvious lesson, of course, never give up. Here's a man, relentless, would not allow the criticism, would not allow all the accusations, all the humiliation to be hurled at him, to in any way unnerve him and dissuade him. He marched forward. And this has nothing to do with you agree with him or don't agree with him, whether you like his style or you don't like his style. That has to be admired. A type of relentlessness. A formidable relentlessness. When you believe in something, commit to it, and never give up. And look what happened. He prevailed. So that's the first simple lesson that's so, so obvious. Lesson number two. Focus. The way you don't let all these things get to you is by having something greater as your goal. So no matter what obstacle, what opposition comes your way, it is the goal that's more powerful that you are shooting for. And again, you can criticize and you can analyze and say it was his ego, his desire to win. Maybe it was his enemies actually opposing him that pushed him further. But there's certain things that were natural. Everyone saw that defiance when he was shot in Butler, Pennsylvania. And that wasn't scripted. And he rose, raised his hand. And I'm not now defying him in any way, God forbid. That's not my intention. But a certain natural drive. I have no doubt in his mind he feels he can be an excellent president and has policies he wants to implement. Again, whether you agree or don't agree, but the commitment to it. So in addition to the first point of keep on fighting and being relentless and never giving up, so having a goal in mind, whatever that goal may be. Now, of course, it's good to have an objective party, people that can tell you that's a good goal. I remember as a teenager, standing by an ocean, Atlantic Ocean, in the summer, all night long, waiting for the, for the waves to go to sleep. They never did. And I learned a certain element of infinity, that we can't have infinity in our lives. And there are things that are worth fighting for. But you have to define that. And when you define that goal, it helps you get through all kinds of challenges. Lesson number three. Don't believe other people's scripts and narratives about you. Now, obviously, a humble person has to always listen to critique and try to grow. But we can't be defined by other people's narratives, especially if they have other intentions. Look at the media. The narrative they wrote. That alone could have been enough reason. And I'll be very honest. I thought he may lose because of that. Because it was an ongoing assault on his character, on his personality. And people are affected by the media. So besides the fact that, and we'll soon talk about trusting the wisdom of the crowds. But it also tells you something. Don't believe in the narratives that others write about you. You write your narrative. And you preempt others doing so. 
I remember my father, who was a journalist, a real seasoned journalist, told me once, he says, always control the story. Don't let someone else write your story. You write the story. So many, many narratives about Mr. Trump, many books that came out, critique from people who were part of his initial first administration. Yet he wrote his narrative. I did it my way, in Sinatra's terms. Let's talk about predictions. It was a very close race, everybody said. In many ways, it was. But if you look at the map, actually, it looks almost all red. If we're not for California and New York, the two largest electoral colleges, I think the two largest, or close to California, for sure, the largest, New York quite large, it would be a landslide. And maybe this is considered a landslide once all the votes will be tallied. What is this country thinking? There's a certain arrogance, east-west coast arrogance. The elite, especially in the liberal media, who think that they know it all. But it's a big country. And you start seeing the analysis, you see that yes, main urban centers, which usually vote Democratic, like New York or California, but you start digging deeper into what they call the rural, you want the common man or woman, there, there are other views. And it makes you think about people, it makes you think about a country like this, expression the wisdom of the crowds. There's something sometimes about a crowd that gives you a certain wisdom. As a speaker, I can tell you, people think, you know, many people are gun-shy and they are very afraid of public speaking. One-on-one -on -one may be easier. I can tell you that in a certain way, when you're talking to the public, there's a wisdom that a crowd has. You know, you're thinking when you talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you can pick their brain, they can pick your brain, you can have a more intimate conversation. There's a certain intimacy when you're speaking to a crowd, there's a vibe. It's hard to really put your finger on it. There's a vibe that emerges, something like more than the sum of the parts, more than the sum of the parts, a type of synergy that you pick up if you're sensitive. There's a wisdom to the crowds. Some of us can be cynical or skeptical about it, but sometimes it really emerges. I have a sense that the majority of this country didn't like certain principles. This may sound subjective to me. You know, people talk about the economy, immigration. There are other so-called lightning rods. But I've heard from quite a few that talked about how America treated Israel. Though it's an ally, but not really being behind them, bothered a lot of people. And I think that was like a moral nerve that it touched. Here's a world going up in flames. It's pretty clear. Anyone has moral certainty has a pretty clear picture. And they saw an ambiguity driven by who knows what, whether it's anti-Semitism or pandering for votes and other areas that I believe that the crowds in this country sense something is wrong. So again, I don't know if it's a vote for Trump or a vote against the opposition, but there's some wisdom in that. And that's a lesson to be learned. Now, this doesn't mean we know the masses can be manipulated and we know that sometimes the masses don't understand. But there are times that we have to be sensitive and recognize there's something to the public's view on a certain matter. Now, I know there's the controversy around the Electoral College and the popular vote, but when you win both, it tells you something. Some more lessons that we can learn from this. There's a mystery to life that we will never put our finger on. And sometimes we don't even understand the mystery ourselves. When you do the right things, things turn out in ways that you can't always expect. I'm not saying this happened deliberately by Mr. Trump, whether it's instinctive or just all the factors came together and converged 
on his behalf. But there is something about a mystery. I was not very pleased, to be very honest, about everything Mr. Trump said. I didn't like some of his style. I thought he did not need to carry on so long at the Republican convention. He had the sympathy of the country on his side after the assassination attempt. I thought it was a slam dunk if he just... But he remained who he was, with the, with the abrasiveness and the bluntness and the distractions. I thought that may be his undoing. And yet there is a mystery. So besides sticking, obviously, with his style, I still, frankly, I would have advised him, try to be more conciliatory, try to welcome in more people, not just that preach to the converted, to those that are already in your corner. Be a visionary. He was who he was, and there's a, there's a certain admiration. I mean, it did work. I still don't agree with that style, but it did work. But I also accept the mystery of things. And that leads me to maybe the most important point of all that I've been talking about even before we knew the election results. Remembering there's only one God. And it's the hearts of leaders and kings that are in the hands of God. Obviously, people have free will and make choices. But there's a bigger story. And it's a bigger story even than 2024. And a bigger story than 2020 and 2016. It's the bigger picture of life. I look at this period in time, I often call it the age of disruption. Because Mr. Trump did disrupt. He disrupted the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the media. I mean, look at the, talk about a lightning rod. He brings out the passions pro, against, no one's neutral. Which fits perfectly into our times, really since the 20th, 21st century began. It began right away with 9-11. The Middle East coming into the United States with a 9-11 attack. The disruptions of the internet, of Amazon, the retail business, YouTube, the smartphone, now AI. We're going through a shift, a transition, a new paradigm, which I am absolutely confident, of course we play a role in it, that this can be turned into a completely new, unprecedented spiritual age, spiritual revolution. And transitions are always going to be disruptive. That's what a transition is. You're moving out of an old comfort zone into a new paradigm, into a new reality. So that's looking at the bigger picture. And I think we'll understand Trump's presidency, both terms, the 45th president and 47th president in time. It's hard to understand completely now. I do see some so-called, you could say, signposts, coordinates, the Abraham Accords, which charted a new path in the Middle East. Israel signs peace treaties with the other Arab countries, Saudi Arabia and others. Changes, it's a game changer. It's already a game changer. He was not given enough credit for it especially now with the Middle East up in flames. So I'm going beyond inflation and even the immigration policies. I know that was so much talked about. But talking about the bigger picture, where the world is headed. In a way, when the United States became a country 250 years ago, it'll actually be in this term. We'll, we'll celebrate 250 years from the inception of the United States. That was a paradigm shift a country for the first time institutionalized the concept that all people are created equal and have inalienable or inalienable rights endowed by the creator, the freedom, which in turn spread to other parts of the world and continues to spread. So looking at 2024, how is that in that context of the revolution, 1776? And being that this is 250 years, a perfect time to ask that question. I would love, if I was speaking to Mr. Trump, I would love to bring that up and say, yes, let's deal with the economy, let's deal with immigration, let's deal with all the immediate things. 
But let's not forget the bigger picture, the bigger vision. The bigger experiment, human experiment. Talk about unprecedented in history. To usher in a new world where machines will maybe take over our menial and mundane labor. And we can aspire to the most important thing of all, the words of Isaiah. No more evil or destruction in the world because the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. That's the ultimate goal of all technology and AI. To be more soulful people. To use the extra time that we have. Be kinder. To explore new horizons. To go to places we've never gone to in the spiritual, psychological, emotional realms. New possibilities. While that also informs the immediate, how we build our lives, our families, our values. And all preserving the fundamentals that God created each person in the divine image. We're all created equal and all have those rights. That's what I would like to see emerge from this. And that to me is the ultimate lesson. That when you step back and get beyond the fray and beyond those ups and downs that the pundits and the media will be talking about, I'm sure, forever, and analyzing every little step, let's look back at the bigger picture. What does this mean in that noble, great experiment called the United States of America? And how that plays a part in the big noble experiment, the divine experiment of all, God creating this world in order for us to transform a material existence into a spiritual divine home. To transform an egocentric life driven by self-interest into a mission-centric life driven by transcendent aspirations. How do we bring personal and global redemption to ourselves, to our families, to our communities, and to the world? And how does that inform our economy, our politics, our foreign relations, our defense, our medical and health concerns? This is the opportunity of a lifetime. So when things happen that are unexpected, its ultimate lesson is be ready for other unexpected things. You know, when things are predictable, we get stuck in that type of like place. Okay, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But when things happen of this nature, an election unexpected, the results and how it all played itself out. To me, this is beyond Mr. Trump. This is him maybe being an agent of the divine God is saying, you know what? Stranger things have happened giving us the hope that new strange things can happen. Bizarre things even. Even things we may not like. And this I'd like to address and conclude a few words to those that see this as a tragic day. Terrible. So first of all, don't buy into all the rhetoric. Step back. What happened after Trump's term? Was anybody... Put aside, people told me I'd be put away into a concentration camp, God forbid. We have to leave the country. So let's lower the volume. You may not agree with everything, but don't buy into the extremism. It's a lot more, a lot more subtle than you may think. That's number one. Number two, that's where we brings out the best in us, adversity. You don't like something? Dig deeper and find a deeper truth within you. Why are you playing victim? Mr. Trump was elected, and now all is lost. Democracy is lost. What, do you have no say in your life? What about your family, your children? Mr. Trump controls that as well. So besides that, to get beyond the doomsday scenarios that so many are painting, it goes back to old politics. And open yourself up to new possibilities. Hey, something like this happened. You know what? I didn't expect it. I wish he didn't win. I wish someone else won. You may say to yourself, 
But it did happen. Become a better person, a greater person. That's what things like this should elicit from us. And when they do, we become greater people. Which brings me back to the point, you control your attitude. You control how you navigate your life. Don't allow events and others to determine your story and your narrative. These are just some lessons that we can learn from this unprecedented comeback and victory. And I hope we can be open-minded enough that this is not, we're not talking here personally about Mr. Trump or anyone. Obviously, he's an individual, and just like everyone, people should have compassion. And I hope he shows compassion. He has a style. It's true. It may not turn everybody on. Also showing respect, I mentioned the crowds of others. What is so sad, people dismissing 70, 71, 75 million people. What's the matter with them? How are they brainwashed? Why do you have to assume that? Why don't you think maybe you were brainwashed? Why are you so sure you're right? A little respect for other people's opinions, even if they're not yours and even if you disagree with them. So this is yet a lesson as well. And maybe that's an ultimate lesson about an election that affects us all. That's not always going to go exactly as you felt it should go. So fine, learn how to coexist, learn how to learn from it, become a better person. The worst thing is to become worse, to dig in and say, this country is not for me. Look what happened. I was rejected. I was betrayed. Come on. Grow up. So this is an opportunity to embrace our true values, embrace our families, embrace that which we love, our values, and build upon that. And yes, may God bless the new president-elect and the vice president and their administration to live up to the highest standards of what this country deserves, to be agents of God like the founding fathers established, to allow us all to serve and fulfill our unique and indispensable mission in this world. God bless America. God bless our leaders. And may we find that harmony within diversity, the e pluribus unum, built on the fact that we all connected, we're all children of, and created in God we trust in that one God that gave us all inalienable rights. Be well and be blessed. Simon Jacobson here. Meaningfullife.com is our website. Please subscribe to our offerings, to our growing YouTube channel. Please share this message. Share. I believe it's a very important message. And please share your comments and thoughts and feedback. May President Trump, may the leaders of this world come together and offer us all a united vision while also showing us how each can fulfill our part in that vision in transforming this world and bringing personal and global redemption, a world filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.